you, Torquasi, for the poetry of your words and the power of your work. I'm Omar Barada. I um, co-teach the Interdisciplinary Seminar and co-organize the IDS Public Lecture Series here at Cooper Union with my colleague Leslie Hewitt. We are extremely pleased and honored that Françoise Vergès accepted our invitation to come speak at Cooper Union in the midst of an extremely busy spring back in France. When she was a fellow at Brown University a couple of years ago, Françoise taught a seminar titled Decolonial Methodology, Pedagogy for a New Era of Dissent and Resistance. I feel that that phrase is a good summary of Françoise Vergès's life's work, a life devoted to building, articulating, and sharing methodologies of resistance to the hegemonies that crush and constrain our lives. This is what she does in her writing, in her teaching, and in her activism. Françoise Vergès is a historian, a political scientist, a cultural critic, though such categories cannot begin to do justice to an expansive body of work on the page and on the ground that has always given priority to the pursuit of liberation over academic validation. Françoise's work has gained international recognition for the way it traces the persistence of colonialism into the present, for the way it maps out networks of transnational solidarity in the global south, and for the way it defines and enacts an anti-racist feminist ethics. Two years ago, Françoise wrote an essay titled Racial Capitalocene, or Is the Anthropocene Racial? where she calls for a re-inscription of environmental history and environmental violence within a long genealogy of racial domination and colonial extractivism. This is a question we've been exploring in the interdisciplinary seminar this year, so we were keen to have her come and expand on this research in progress, and we're very happy this is happening in conversation with the work of Torquasi Dyson. Her proposed talk for tonight is, is titled Capitalocene, Waste, Race, and Gender. Please join me in welcoming Françoise Vergès. Good evening. It's uh, quite difficult to come after Torquasi Dyson, but I will try. Thank you to Cooper Union and to my friend Omar who invited me. So, who cleans the world? This is my starting point. Every day, in every city of the world, invisible, thousands of women are opening the city. They clean the space necessary for neoliberal and financial capitalism to function. They are doing a dangerous job because of the chemical product they use and the heavy load they carry or push. They are usually tra have, sorry, they have usually travel hours in the early morning or late at night, and their work is underpaid and considered to be underqualified. They are women of color, usually in their 40s or in 50s. A second group, we share with the first one an intersection of class, gender, and race, go to middle class home to cook, clean, and take care of children and the elderly, so that those who employ them can go working in the place that the former group of women have cleaned. Without them, without their work, which has to be necessary, which is absolutely necessary, but has to be invisible, neoliberal and patriarchal capitalism will not function. Indeed, nursery and school where children are dropped, offices, toilets, restaurants, meeting rooms, commercial malls, sports studios, university, etc., where engineers, bankers, insurers, digital economy people, lawyers, judges, and so on work or rest must be clean. It is very important that they circulate, enter this space without having to acknowledge that work. It must be done, it is indispensable, but it must remain hidden. It is a global situation, and it is primarily white women who act as supervisors and regulators of the labor of these women, black and immigrant women. Working in the world is far from being a new question, but I want to look at it from a specific angle than those with which we are familiar, leading to a reflection on a new politics of the clean and dirty, linked to the anxiety raised by pollution, environment, 
clean air and clean water and climate change. I will focus on the role and place of women of color, though I acknowledge that men of color are doing also their part, cleaning, uh, polluting, uh, you know, uh, nuclear waste, uh, digital waste, and solid waste. But I do think that nonetheless the question of women is, is important. Uh, very quickly, you know, the stories, the theories, sorry, we are familiar with are the feminist theory about women and paid domestic and care work. The fact that women are responsible for, you know, 75% of the, the unpaid domestic work, spending up to three hours more a day doing housework than men, and all this, you know, this is very, okay. The second one, the demand for better sharing of this burden and for a salary for domestic work. We are also familiar with a theory that shows that female domestic workers facilitated other women's entry, white and middle class women, in the paid labor a market in increasingly labor, a larger proportion. We are also familiar with exploitation of women and refugee women do, doing domestic work worldwide. And finally, we are familiar with a critique by feminists of color of a white feminism which frame white women liberation in terms of freedom from housework and push for removing legal and social barriers uh, to women entering wage labor thus consolidating the racial divide between women of color and white women. In summary, the care cleaning industry, and I, here I really want to bring the two together, I don't make a division between caring and cleaning. So the care cleaning industry, uh, you know, uh, both are, uh, sorry, has long been racialized and gender. But it's also today, currently a very growing industry worldwide again reaching, you know, million of US dollar uh, annual growth, uh, and with the Asia Pacific region experiencing the fattest growth. So there is a lot of agency now working in that, you know. And though commercial cleaning service accounts today for the higher cleaning service market, residential cleaning is expected to grow rapidly. Leading companies in the industry aware of the negative image of the exploited cleaning worker insist today on legal protection promotion and health saf safety. There's a lot about green cleaning. So, as I, as I say, all these elements will deserve to be discussed further. But I want to explore the intersection between cleaning and caring, race, gender, and capital. From this angle, the capitalism as producer of waste and of women as waste, of human, and, and the cleaning and caring industry, and how both construct a new division between cleanliness and dirtiness in the sense that you who has the right to green spaces, clean street, clean water, clean space, you know, fun and even plants and birds and everything, and who is being denied this right. But also, how do we, this has affected the way in which cleanliness and dirtiness are defined today? How a new hygienic rhetoric is being deployed in the age of green capitalism and sustainable disaster. The later being both about the rhetoric and environmental catastrophe and its management. The geopolitics of clean dirty draw a line between area of dirtiness where disease and sustainable birth rates, violence against women, unlawful practice controlled by gang are you know, constructed versus police area where children can safety play Women can walk freely even at night. Streets are, you know, close to traffic to allow for leisure, shopping and dining, and there are trees and birds and butterflies. A proliferation of eye lines, if you wish, and that you would be familiar with. So a word of enclave through the militarization of the city to provide safe, clean spaces for the wealthy. I also want to explore why the racial element of this workforce, the one that is doing the cleaning, caring industry, has not produced the kind of white resentment that we have observed for other jobs. There is no national racist anti-migrant movement which is built on the argument that women of color are stealing white women jobs. And if the Islamophobic feminism that we witness in Europe has mobilized against veiled women in the public space or in you know, daycare center, they have not protested against veiled women who clean public space, offices, hotel rooms, restaurants, and all, everything else. 
So this, you know, I'm interested in. So my f the first thing is about why, you know, capitalism producing waste. I will start with a slave ship, you know. I mean, as you, you know, this, the moment of shaping the landscape, of course, of the world, and the question of water as a cleaning element, but also water as grave, you know. The slave ship being also the place of filth and death, and the fact that it has to be cleaned constantly so that the enslaved, the captive, could be sold. So capitalism is effectively waste production from the beginning. And today, according to the World Bank, 11 million tons of solid waste are produced every day. In 2016, the world city generated 201 billion of solid waste, and it's expected also to go, you know, everywhere. And although they account for only 16% of the world population, high-income countries combined are generating more than one-third of the world waste. waste. And by 2050, West uh, will be you know, double everywhere. But this does not count into account this data from the World Bank and the IMF, do not take into account the huge amount of waste generated by imperialism, what the armies leave behind, the country and the body that are wasted. Further, giving data for each region, as I've given you, masks the fact that waste is, being, is circulating. Polluted, uh, uh, you know, hair, polluted hair is circulating water, you know, arms and everything. International institutions, foundation and government have been discussing what to do with waste. And as I say, an important industry has been developed with expert engineers and technicians. A green cleaning industry is being advocated or in the word of Sil Pakaza, World Bank Urban Development Specialist, and I quote, it makes economic sense to properly manage waste. Uncollected waste and poorly disposed waste have significant health and environmental impact. The cost of addressing this impact is many times higher than the cost of developing and operating simple, adequate waste management system. Solution exists and we can help country get there. It's a new hygienic, hygienic and civilizing mission about what is proper and what is clean and dirty, which is being developed. Waste, as Fred McDuff and Chris William have argued, is a sign of capitalism's success. In fact, the economic surplus, you know, that the, all these aspects that serve no socially uh, useful purpose in fact, are growing. The number of this, you know, uh, su surplus is growing. And capitalism is not so much about con producing for consumption. It's about, you know, producing for producing. It's about surplus of production, production that will never be consumed. And so this is, you know, everywhere going, uh, you know, that we don't even realize. And the fact that all this, even, you know, the proliferation of of product design for obsolescence or to simulate new ones. The giant warehouse for online sale, the e-commerce meaning the production of millions of content board in 2015, everything, everyday producing waste and everyday people are cleaning that waste. The World Bank and similar in uh, institutions do not consider the, when they give all this number, the geopolitics of waste and waste. Oh, and this is what I argue, that the racialization of the world started with effectively the racialization of landscape, people, and production. This is what Ruthie Wilson Gilmore has called the state sanction or extra-legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature deaths. So, this is what I wanted to do, the production of waste. This is, I mean, the capitalist is not producing for consumption, but to produce, you know, to, is producing waste. And now, now the, you know, the question of capitalism, because most people talk about the Anthropocene, although, you know, I'm not a fetishist about words, so it does not matter much, but what, it's a question of what we are talking about. But I use capitalism effectively because I'm following Jason Moore, that it's uh, you know, to insist on the role and the responsibility of capitalism in the origin of climate change. In the uh, essay that Omar quoted, I argue that capitalism was racial, that climate change had to do with slavery, colonialism, imperialism, and capitalism, in other words, with race. 
So this race, in fact, became a code to design people and landscape that could be wasted. This is, you know, my argument. First, indigenous population, then enslaved African, were made disposable, and their wasted body mixed with the hearth of silver and gold mines in the Americas, before mixing with the hearth of the plantation in the Caribbean, Americas, and Indian Ocean. Indigenous and black women were assigned to the world of social reproduction, their womb made into capital, and black children, indigenous children, transformed into currency in this vast circulation of, you know, wasted body. In order to understand how race, gender, race, and capitalism work together, I had to go back to that history of primitive accumulation through the production of wasted land and wasted people. And as many critics have argued, the notion of the Anthropocene masks the long history of systemic destruction that is at the heart of colonialism and capitalism. In discourse on colonialism, Césaire wrote about the shock in return, the boomerang effect of slavery and colonialism, saying that what surprised European with Nazism was what its, de its daily barbarism had been applied to white men. But until then, as Césaire argued, they had absorbed these white men, tolerated, shut the hive, legitimized what was done in their names to non-European people. So what imperialism and capitalism inflicted on people in the global south and majority in the global north was, is tolerated, justi legitimized, justified, but it cannot touch the West. However, narrow liberal capitalist destruction does not respect borders and walls will not stop seas and air to be polluted. That shock in return was dis is now touching the West and this is why now we have this old discourse about the Anthropocene. There is also still the idea that protection from the worst is possible, and throughout the world, particularly in the global south, and clave with clean water, clean trees, birds, where children can breathe, are constructed and protected by armed guards. Climate change, if I may we say, is partial. Or, as Catherine Yusuf in her book, A Billion Black Anthropocene or None, remarked, and I quote, if the Anthropocene proclaim a sudden concern with the exposure of environmental harm to white liberal community, it does so in the wake of history in which these arms have been knowingly experienced, exported to black and brown community under the rubric of civilization, progress, modernization, and capitalism. She challenge the blind, racial blindness of Anthropocene and write the, the Anthropocene simply consolidate power via this innocent in the present to affect decisions that are made about the future and its mode of survival. This externalization of pollution is everywhere and has been going for a long time. In poor neighborhoods, there have been a lot of reports in the United States, in this country, but also in the global south. I mean, we have just to remember this history, this long history of you know, externalization of damage and harm. I'm thinking, you know, for France, just for France, because I'm coming from, I mean, I'm a citizen of that country. I mean, the nuclear tests, which were done in the Pacific Islands, systematically, or Algeria before the independence, the mining in New Caledonia, the destruction of indigenous community in Guyana, in French Guyana. So this externalization, constant externalization of pollution, but there is nonetheless both that externalization to protect the white world, but at the same time, the shock in return that is being nonetheless being perceived. And so the protection being, you know, the militarized, militarized protection increasing. In their essay, Bionecropolitics, Marx, Surplus Population, and the Spatial Dialectics of Reproduction and Race Capitalism, Michael McIntyre and ADJS Nas suggest, you know, propose the notion of the Bionecropolis and Necrobiopolis to, enforce, to uh, uh, insist on geographical fluidity of accumulation and racialized difference. They demonstrate how racial marking of land and body continue to be a way of rendering certain body superfluous. Canalize, criminalize, ostracize, stigmatize the necropolis, that speciality through which the necropolitan is defined or constituted, they say, becomes a reverse of multifarious mat material proportion of negative symbolic potential and death liminal pressure, a reserve of labor, a nature reserve, 
open for appropriation, a reserve of potentially vacant land for settlers, and a reserve of wasteland for colonialism, human, and environmental detritus. And they had member of the surplus laboring population working long hours for low wages are resented for undercutting white workers' wage. But as I say in the beginning, this does not concern domestic workers. There is no resentment for, you know, a woman of color, and they don't, are not perceived for undercutting white women wages. So that's a very, I, this I think is an important uh, uh, thing to be said. So this question of cleanliness, dirtiness, and performing an exhausted body. So the, the, my first remarks is about, you know, about the linked needs of the neoliberal and heteropatriarchy to, to uh, drawing new borders between cleanliness and dirtiness in an age where the concern for clean air, clean water, clean house, need for green space are growing. And the second remark will be about these two bodies of today that I see, the performing body and the exhausted body. So the first, the, my first remark is about the clean and dirty. I mean, it's, the story of cleanliness in Europe, you know, tells a story of a slow movement toward personal and public hygiene. And I mean, there was a lot of things, you know, about the very dirty city of Europe. And even when Crusader arrived in the Middle East, Arabs were astonished and horrified by their disregard for personal cleanliness. And later, when Europeans debark in Africa, Asia, and America, natives also could not believe that human beings could be so indifferent to their own hygiene. For their part, Europeans were often in awe of the cleanliness of cities they enter but then destroy, and of people they subsequently massacred. But by the 19th century, building on an ideology of race developed under slavery and colonization, Europeans drew a strong contrast between a clean Europe and clean European bodies, again, dirty indigenous dwelling, dirty bodies, dirty sexuality, and healthy habit of food, care, and health. In the current reworking of the geopolitical cleanliness, dirtiness, and to go back to the distinction between, you know, the made uh, between bio-necropolis and necrobiopolis, I want to discuss how the invisibility of women of color cleaning job create the visibility of clean home and clean spaces. Women of color in the cleaning industry can enter and walk in the bio-necropolis. They are allowed to enter the gate of the city of its controlled building and street, but they do it as phantoms, as specters. And this geopolitics uh, uh, of cleanliness is also about the representation in the world and how it connects with the racial specialization we could just reflect, you know, on the accumulation of image of filth and garbage in the global south that we are, you know, that we see every day in the media, I mean, quite often, and how it contributes to fill the Western public with awe, you know, with people saying, why are these countries so dirty? Why people are not cleaning their street? How can human work in this filthy place? Don't they see it as bad for the health and for the children? and all the warning about hygiene and health for, you know, for Western traveler to this country. The image of mountain of garbage, of dirty street, of dirty rivers, of dirty beaches, of dirty neighborhood, of plastic covering fields and beaches, of people, women, children, and men searching through mountain of garbage, of people pushing carts filled with refuse, of children swimming in polluted water, all this is being shown and associated with the global south contribute to the construction of the distinction between dirty and clean that is being naturalized and not even effectively connected with economic and social and political condition. Adding to this proliferation of image as report by, you know, by in, on NGO effort to teach hygiene to these people, an alarming report about plastic and polluted spaces that will make that Western tourists can no longer go and to enjoy these beaches. All this creates an image of people living in dirt and filth for reasons that remain hidden, you know, uh, even though they, and they are a legacy of colonial urbanization and racial restoration of the landscape, of structural adjustment program that demanded effectively the reduction of public expenses and the externalization of polluted industry. Slowly, the feeling that cleaning that world is an impossible task is slowly ingrained. What remains is how to keep pollution at bay for reaching the clean areas. 
And this can be happen within a country, of course. My second remark was about this question of you know, the economy of exhaustion that goes with neoliberal, neoliberalism. All women who are doing uh, cleaning jobs, and whether they are in Maputo, Buenos Aires, Ma Washington, Paris, or, or Rabat, talk about being exhausted, about their body being exhausted. The economy exhaustion has a long history in the modern world. It started with you know, colonial slavery. You know, we have just to remember the testimony of the enslaved you know, being absolutely exhausted. And the industrial revolution, you have the testimony of the exhausted body of white workers, but there, the later, often the reduction of hours and hard physical work sank to the exhaustion of racialized body in the colonies. And today, neoliberal, uh, neoliberal countries still rest on mining uh, the exo to exhaustion the bodies of migrants and refugees and of their own people of color. Compare this economy of exhaustion, you know, uh, of, uh, of this old woman with a discourse about the performing body of neoliberalism, able to sleep very few hours, always on the move, speeding through many tasks, traveling around. The performing male neoliberal body as a phantom body that gave him energy, a fossil energy for its limitless motor and performance and is a rationalized body. There is a growing literature on acceleration, on the possibility and impossibility of futurity, on the feeling of pessimism, catastrophe, and the end of the human species. There are questions about time and space. Claire Colbrook, in a collection of essay, Anthropocene Feminism, write that Anthropocene concerned two temporalities, opening human to geolo or geological impact, drawing us back to human agency and human historical force. But there are times according to the West. A more complex clash of temporality, and this go back to the question of exhaustion, for indigenous and racialized community, especially women, are effectively will complicate that notion of the two temporality. And I will try to be clear here, but I'm still working on this, so bear with me. So repairing the world by cleaning and caring for it is very important. It's not just about cleaning, I mean, to protein, but it has to be. Women of color take care, repair a world left broken and dirty by colonialism and capitalism. Three, people of color clean, cleaning uh, the huge amount of solid waste produced by the global north. It's an endless wor work. It's never done. It's never finished. So, this is, on the one hand, the kind of temporality. It has to be done, but it can never be fully done. It's endless. It goes back. So there is a moment of time. So cleaning and caring take time that's never finished. And it's a time that clashes with the speed of neoliberalism. Then, about still cleaning and caring, this question still of temporality. Cleaning and repairing what has been laid waste in the past, what has been broken, is yet to be done, has not been done fully. We still have to repair a lot, the body, the salts, the land, the forest, the seas and river, the animal of plant that has been devastated. But what we are trying to repair and clean, you know, the wounds and damage of the past, we have to clean and repair what is being done in the present, and cleaning and repairing what we already should be repairing, even though we don't see the consequence yet of what is happening today, but we should already be cleaning and repairing it, you know. And we don't see this, you know, that what's happening today either. We don't see them because they are specialized elsewhere, Puerto Rico, Haiti, Mozambique, or they are p happening in community made invisible here, you know, here in the West. Repairing damage that are currently you know, increasing the vulnerability to death of people worldwide is being effectively done while we are still repairing what has been done. So here we are caught into different temporality, into very pressing temporality, but both of them are different effectively work to be done. Temporality of, uh, that people of, of color have experienced, you know. So time, we could say, is rationalized. So what is to be done after all, you know, all these different things that could look very, um, and of course, I have not, I have not this. So 
I would say the, this question for me of, of cleaning has been very important because I notice quite often, you know, in uh, some, uh, I'm doing anti-racist work and anti imperialist work in France and you got meetings of young people and they leave the space, they don't even clean it. And I'm always saying like, we're gonna clean the space, you know, what, what, what do you think? How you think it's gonna, you're gonna come back tomorrow? How is it gonna get clean? You know, and you enter. I mean, this. Uh, I remember also when uh, uh, un some university were occupied in Paris. So I went. I was invited by a, a young student of color, and the the, the amphitheater was absolutely filthy. And so, okay. And uh, so I started. I I was you know on the table uh, behind the table. I was supposed to talk. There was a lot of you know things being left. You know, coffee cup or whatever. So I started to clean. And they said to me, no, we're gonna do it. I said, when are you gonna do it? This has been done for, you know, it's here for three days already. Who do you think gonna clean it? When you're gonna done with your occupation, we're gonna clean it. So it's this question of, you know, like for me, of this absolute importance of making that world being recognized and acknowledged. And of course, domestic workers are doing a lot of struggle. I mean, they are doing their strike, and I think this has to be really supported. I do think that domestic workers bring together so many, you know, threats, the question of migration, the questions of uh, sexualization and racialization of the work, the underpaid, underqualified, necessary but invisible, the economy of exhaustion, the question of, uh, you know, of environment and health because of the chemical product, all this is together. So this is the new kind of effectively, this not just like a workspace that has to, to make it safe, is really about all this, about the world we live in and that they are cleaning so we can go every day to restaurant and to university or wherever we are going or commercial mall. So this, for me, this invisibility, this is kind of like, uh, I would say like a building in which these people are in the basement and during the night when we are sleeping and we, well, so many people are sleeping, they go and they clean. They clean and then they go back to the basement and so all this can be, you know, the circulation is possible. So paying attention really every day to who is cleaning the world and supporting all the struggle. Paying attention also in the question of time, this question of temporality, I think is very important and to rethink what is the temporality of emancipation. To rethink what is growth, you know, the growth of nature and human would took would take, which take time versus the growth thought in neoliberalism. Also if, uh, rethinking what is protection, what is, how do we protect things, you know, what will be a decolonial queer feminist indigenous politics of protection that is not left to the police and to the state and to the neoliberal? What is to protect and how? What will be a decolonial pedagogy of protection? And to conclude, I want to, you know, uh, read, to conclude with a proposal by a young Tamil artist about what is to be, you know, how to clean and what is cleaning. In March uh, 2018, I, I was in Chennai and I, I saw a show with the title was Labor, Worker, uh, sorry, Workers of the World Relax. And it was curated by a young Dalit, Krishna Bana. And she say, I mean, she wrote in the presentation, Labor has to be looked at critically beyond what was in the Western anthropological representation of colonial photo archive and in the valorized post-independence representation. And labor is really effectively represented in, in art. And I, I put some, you know, of the CD uh, uh, you know, uh, the, what she did about her mother. Okay, this doesn't, okay, it doesn't matter, but you said that. Uh, uh, that effectively the representation of, of women who work, domestic worker and adult workers. So I was really interested by that show about, which was called Worker of the World Relax. But about that, I mean, uh, in the show, which was very interesting, uh, there was a series of the women who cleaned the Chennai railway station, and I can say this is very hard work. And there was some, you know, like three pages just close by, and on which a young Dalit man has written, and I quote, that older woman that you speak about who clean human faces, I write taking her to be of my family, my grandfather. Cleaning faces is not an ordinary thing. For this, you require almost medical studies. With bare hands, my grandfather cleaned human faces, that he did, to such an extent that it soaked into the line of his hand, soaked like blood in blood. 
in the night, with the same hand, it will feed my father. With the same hand, he will himself eat. With all this, getting habituated to it because of that, my father also had no hesitation in cleaning faces. My father also did the faces cleaning. In my view, more than honoring that woman, I think we should show that, like everyone, she's equal. And one, that women should stop cleaning faces, everyone should clean their own faces themselves. Or else, we should all should join with the women and clean human faces like that, though doing this way, that women can be one of us as equal, not only by seeing it by words of mouth, but by feeling it. Thank you.